On today's show, we have a very in-depth conversation about the success rate of second-round running backs. There's a whole bunch of news to cover, and then we dive in to part two of our running back rankings. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. Make sure you like this show and enjoy it. Today's show is sponsored by Head & Shoulders Scalp Shield Technology. Regular use of Head & Shoulders Scalp Shield Technology provides a continuous invisible shield of protection against dandruff, itch, and dryness, renewing your protection with every wash. Get up to 100% dandruff protection that's never not working with Head & Shoulders Scalp Shield Technology available at Walmart. Listen up, everybody. Your fantasy football drafts are coming. It's time to show your league what puny and pathetic trash bags they truly are. The ultimate draft kit from the fantasy footballers is the easiest way to annihilate them. Tiered rankings, full projections, sleepers, breakouts, it's got it all. Go to ultimatedraftkit.com and secure yours immediately. I said do it now. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Oh, it's football time. (laughs) Did you know? Oh, I knew it. You didn't forget this time? I did not forget this time. Football tonight, because this time, it's personal. Why is it personal? Uh, Because that's what a lot of the movie trailers have led me to believe, that this time around, the second time, it's always much more personal. What makes the first kind of interaction, the first conflict, so impersonal? Is well, what I want to know. In the football world, what makes it impersonal is that the Hall of Fame game is the first game, and mm-hmm, that's a mm-hmm. that's a wink wink game. <laughs> it's a wink wink. <laughs> yeah, that's game? oh yeah, it's an NFL game. Wink. Ah, uh, I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, <laughs> sophisticated start to the show. Always. With that introduction, which I think yeah. might, uh, that might be Brooks's favorite. Was that uh, Darnold Schwarzenegger? Is that who that was? Yeah, that's uh, got to be my it's favorite. It's actually Darnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, Thursday, August 12th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Excited to be getting into our running back rankings part two today. Never not working. New segment. We're going to yeah. be everything about. Winning at fantasy football means taking advantage of every extra edge you can get over your opponent. You cannot, and I'll be the first to admit it, it'd be nice to claim that I have uh, the ability to see the future perfectly and know exactly what's going to happen in every injury and every player. There is an element of luck in fantasy football. It's a I mean, there's a significant element of, you know, luck involved so all you're doing in fantasy is trying to give yourself the highest odds of success Yeah, it's all about that probability and that's what it the today's never not working is it's all about breaking down some probability of second round running backs i am looking forward to the conversation we have nfl news to talk about getting to some mailbag if we have time few reminders right here at the top before we kick it off the Ultimate Draft Kit is available now at ultimatedraftkit.com, yeah, yeah. as you as you know. Uh, Apple Podcasts, if you can follow us over there, review the show, we'd appreciate it. If you're listening on Spotify, thank you so much. YouTube.com slash The Fantasy Footballers, if you want to watch the show. Mike and I... Oh, we're... Yeah. I mean, we we're, we're, somehow wore the same shirt. I, I like to call it burgundy because it's not. It, cause then we can go burgundy bros. I know it's... Oh, I see. It's not... Look, I'm not a master of color. I did an image search well, for, it's not a for color, burgundy. And it's th- not a color that you would imagine an accidental match on. It, no, because it's, it's a, not a good color. It's a great color. Thank <laughs> you, Jason. You are right. It's a deep red. It's not. It's uh, not. It's muted? A, it's a red clay. It's clay? I think it's clay. Al? It's old, Al, it's old salmon. What do you have to say about this? <laughs> oh, don't talk about salmon right now. I feel like Denzel it's Mims. like a burnt something. Ooh, like, not a burnt, burnt orange, but... Yeah. Not a burnt orange? Burnt salmon. (laughs) Yeah, burnt salmon. Burnt salmon. Yeah, we're both matching burnt salmon shirts. YouTube will let us know. 
Some um, color expert will show up. Well, are, actually. Are there people that go to school for that? The no. Co- like a MD and color wheel? But there are people who know their colors very, very well. Not us. No. <laughs> Clearly. Oh, no. Um, I, red. The, right. It's a red right. shirt. Uh, let's get this going. Never not working. Presented by Head and Shoulders Scalp Shield Technology. Available at Walmart. All right. As promised, brand new segment. In the preseason, we're going to be talking through some draft tips, tricks, insights, strategies to help you go the extra mile, outplay your league mates, really outwork your league mates. That's what it takes to win a title, not finish third, not finish fourth, but actually win it. Uh, give yourself that highest probability at success. Mike, you are kind of taking the mantle on today's Never Not Working Indeed. segment. Yeah, we've it's been a hot topic of conversation this offseason of rookie running back for the Denver Broncos. Javante Williams was drafted in the second round. Melvin Gordon, he's still there. He's the Wiley vet who has been productive throughout his career. He's been a good fantasy football player. He was pretty solid last year as well. And so I wanted to take a look, you know, it, this is a probability based game. So let's look back at the history, the recent history, I should say, of second round running backs. So since 2011, we have 29. We now have 30 with Javante, but I did not include him in the sample because you don't know how he, I don't know yet. how he did. Uh, so in that time, we have three rookies that didn't play just because of injury. Like they, before the season, they didn't even get to see the field. So that brings us down to 26 combos of of a veteran running back and a second round pick. Veterans outproduced the rookie in fantasy finish eight of 26 times. So you're already at a very low probability that Melvin Gordon will outproduce Javante Williams. Now let's break that down even more. Rookies who received a touch in at least 10 games, that's 19 times. Okay, so mm-hmm. it, we're, we're, we're whittling down the sample. The veteran finished higher five of those 19 times. Wow. And that was no Sean Moreno. That was a crazy year, if you remember that. Frank Gore, of course. DeMarco Murray beating out Derrick Henry, Reggie Bush, and then Daryl Henderson last year, which barely even counts. Point of order here. Yeah, are you, How are you defining veteran? Just the incumbent? Yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 definitely. And it, here... And what we know is only twice has the pair actually been useful together where they both finished inside the top. It's very 30. valuable. So, and gets funny enough, both times that was Giovanni Bernard and his teammate. <laughs> was, That's funny. It was Gio and Jeremy Hill and it was Gio and Joe Mixon. That kind of feels even like an outlier because Gio fits a mold. He's not a, he never came in to be a workhorse right. back. So that kind of makes sense. So, it, but the point was, it's usually it's one or the other. It's not going to be both of them. But so the the biggest takeaway here to me, and 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 I'm not. This isn't like the 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 death blow to Melvin Gordon. This isn't the 100 percent in on Javante Williams. Just looking at historically what has happened. So when a rookie receives a touch in 10 games, 21 percent of the time the veteran out produ- the the veteran was a, a top 20 guy. 42 percent of the time. So eight of the 19 rookies ended up as the top 20. And 73% of the time, if a rookie touches the ball in at least 10 games, 73% of the time, the rookie outscores the veteran in fantasy finish. Now, that that's very, very interesting. Uh, good work on that. There are some... <laughs> that didn't sound sincere. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's solid work. Um, my, my like question here... I talk here, to my kids. My question here, though, is... Good when, job, champ. You know, if I <laughs> look, <laughs> great job. Now let me poke a hole in it. Um, I'm curious how often a team spends a second round pick when they have what is considered in the league uh, a, an elite running back, not necessarily you know in his prime or whatever, but it is a situation where everyone was shocked when Denver drafted Javante right like when we're when prior mm. to the draft let's just say this prior to the draft when you were looking at all the best landing spots for running backs Miami Atlanta te- teams that were yeah the Jets and and obviously Pittsburgh I never once heard Denver brought up because they had 
uh, high, you know, at the very least, one of the highest paid running backs in the sure. league. So I'm wondering if that makes this situation different. And really, what you what you just enlightened me on says to me, Jason, I'm like, maybe I don't want either of them. I've I've dug into second and third round running backs over the last ten years as well, trying to get a gauge of how they perform compared to ADP, because we've all lived through Amir Abdullah. Mm -hmm. You know, Cam Akers rookie season was he was on a lot of waiver wires. Uh, Miles Sanders, you couldn't play him for a long time. David Montgomery, you couldn't play him, and trying to sift through it as well because. You know, that's that's interesting to me to hear that number of 73% of the time when they get a touch in at least 10 games, they outperform the veteran. Williams is being drafted ahead of Gordon right now. The 27, 27th running back off the board, Gordon is 30th. Melvin Gordon is being paid $9 million to play football on this team this year. So I think we're all trying to find what you do with it. Now, to me, when I got at the end of my research, I got to the point where more often than not, you're disappointed relative to the hype about these second and third rounders in year one. However, Trey Sermon and Javante Williams, which are the two, you know. The second and third The guys. second and third, because yeah. there's Michael Carter, he's later. Uh, there's Travis Etienne, he's earlier. Mm -hmm. But the second and third round guys, both of their draft costs to me are worth the risk. Agreed. Which, like, I, I wanted to get to the end of that and say stay away. But I got to the end of it and said, well, it might not work out, but who cares? Because your draft price for the upside is not that high. And I think the best advice for fantasy players is take that information Mike just gave you, combine it with the reality that you cannot draft Javante Williams in the fifth round and put him in your lineup week one. If that's how you're approaching the draft, if you're punting running back and you're going you know, you go quarterback, you go tight end, you go wide receivers, and then you go, man, I'm just going to slot Javante in as my running back two on week one. You might have a problem because sure. he may get, he'll probably have touches in more than 10 games. He should, but you might not be happy with the touches till week nine, week 10. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I don't disagree at all that that week one plugging Javante right in is probably a recipe for despair of you just being frustrated shouting at the TV why is Melvin Gordon getting the touches put Javante in so and this is this is a complete this is end of season fantasy finish that's what I was looking at so I I right, firmly believe right. by the end Javante will be the more valuable running back and and you know, it's a uh, like a a difference here just to piggyback what you were saying Javante you know fifth sixth round Trey Sermon uh, around there late as, much as, later yeah. as well that could change by the time we're in the at the end of August and people have seen these players in preseason. I mean, the Amir Abdullah hype, where which I was and David I, Montgomery, I was a remember, leader. Remember, he was Kareem Hunt, Matt Nagy's Kareem Hunt. Yes, year one. Yeah, I was a a founding father of the Amir Abdullah hype. I loved the prospect, and he was okay in drafts. And then he hit that one cut. Mm. In priest, it was it was the cut her around was, the world exactly, and you saw in the split in a, in the blink of an eye, Amir Abdullah's ADP jumped two full rounds from that one play. So that definitely could happen. That it, was it, uh, it was our fault too. Oh yeah, it was. Well, it's it's uh, the fantasy football community, but I'm saying Amir Abdullah ended up as a fourth round pick. Miles Sanders was in that range as well. So was David Montgomery. They were all up into the fourth. They weren't. Six round guys. Well, and in recent history, you dealt with um, like DeAndre Swift. It was it was a slower road for DeAndre Swift. I, uh, I wanted to bring up even um, Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, is it, in that category. If you're talking second round guys who got off to a slow start and then explode at the end of the year, there's perhaps no better example than J.K. Dobbins last year. Comes in with the incumbent. Right. Mark Ingram was there, wasn't really utilized. Second half of the year, they're like. Let's go. Let's make that change to the to the juice, the guy mm -hmm. who's actually got, you know, uh, some speed on the field and he dominates week 11 on. He was never outside of the top 20 running backs, including two times as a top 6 running backs. He helped people win championships. That being said, I think he was a bad draft pick last year because 
up through week 10 of the season, he only had two games where he was a top 20 back, and you didn't start him in either of those games. Are you this really going to – this is Dobbins, Dobbins. Dobbins. J.K. Dobbins. So are you really going to draft and hold on – like if you drafted J.K. Dobbins last year, I don't know that you made the playoffs to get those great runs because you had a guy on your bench for the first two-thirds of the season that did – jack squat for your lineup other than clog your roster and then you held on to him or you were someone that picked him up off of waivers when he wasn't doing much <laughs> what's, what's funny is in recent history ironically the biggest disappointments in this category are Denver Bronco running backs genuinely the draft capital spent on Royce Freeman oh yeah yeah was extremely high and the draft capital spent on Monty Ball was extremely high and both players ended up well below their ADP I, I my takeaway is probably not a good idea to say, hey, I'm just going to grab Melvin Gordon. Maybe I get a special year from him because it sounds like probability wise, I won't. Like even yes. if Williams isn't a difference maker, the the kind of cannibalization in the backfield says Melvin Gordon doesn't have the potential to be a league winner. So investing yes. that pick mm -hmm. might be more of a risk than. Then we think, uh, and, and I don't know how that what that would say about Raheem Mostert because you're you're going later. I'm starting to get very worried about Mostert. I don't know how to feel. I don't. I don't. One week, I one week I am I'm all about Mostert. You see practice reports. He's by far the best running back. He's exploding on every play. The thing about Mostert that I think is very different than Melvin Gordon here is Melvin Gordon has always been a volume back, someone that gets his fantasy points yeah, by yeah. touching the ball 20, 25 times a game. Whereas Mostert. His fantasy production comes on like ten touches. He he doesn't need much. He just takes one, you know, with his speed to the house. So I think he'll be okay for a team that looks like they'll run the ball a little bit more than the Broncos. But this is great research, and I think for draft season, I'm probably out on both running backs, and then I'll look to trade for Javante or pick him up off of waivers. All right, that was never not working. Good discussion, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, especially when Jason started off, he's just kind of like. Yeah, thanks, Mike. <laughs> I got um, I got my hair tussled. Yeah, uh, get. I got a little a piece of bubble gum and sent on my way. <laughs> Look at you. Uh, get up to 100% dandruff protection that's never not working, just like that segment, with head and shoulders scalp shield technology available at walmart.com. News and notes from around the league, presented by Sleeper. Uh. One piece of news from our company is we got this out on Twitter yesterday. I had to make the very, very, very difficult decision to cancel our yeah. late August live show here in Phoenix. Um, sent refunds out to ticket holders. We were very excited about that event. Ultimately, it came down to you know the health and safety of our fans and our local community and the unpredictability of the surge and what's happening with COVID right now. So there was no way to predict with certainty that we could have that event in a safe manner based on all of the things that we had planned. Mm -hmm. Obviously we built that show out before <laughs> the recent history. So um, very disappointed to have to announce that. But at the same time, we know that brighter days are ahead and we're very excited about those days. The global tour in 2022 <laughs> is going to rock. So stay tuned. I almost want to do it. I don't think my wife would like that, but it's like one show per continent. No, per, I don't think we need to state. hit each continent. Well, he's a global. Yeah, oh, I'm going. Boy. I'm going international. You know how many bonjours that is? A lot. A lot. All right, <laughs> Allen Robinson, camp string, <laughs> held yeah. out. Held out of practice uh, after being listed as a late scratch. We'll monitor that. Will Fuller still hasn't practiced since July 29th due to a foot injury. This one's not, not looking good. That's why he built in that suspension. He wanted an extra week mm. off. So uh, we'll see what happens there. What do we do with this news? This is more significant. The Cowboys, you shared this tweet with me, and I, when I saw the tweet, Brooks, can you find the actual tweet? I want you to read it. The Cowboys are tweeting about Dak Prescott. When I saw the contents of the tweet in our Slack channel, I never would have thought it came from the actual Dallas account. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the wording, the phrasing, and then the formatting of the tweet was essentially... Can you read that, Brooks? Do you have that for us? It's not a setback. And it's not a reason to worry, but Dak Prescott is planning on getting another MRI. <laughs> what mean, a setup! 
that's just that's literally like Jason. Whatever you do, I want you to know that there's no chance you have a spider on you right now. But but don't look down. Yeah. Don't look down. I promise you're fine. Whatever you do, don't look down. I will say this. I don't view this as something serious. I view this as something foolish. I think that they were trying to get ahead of, like, they're going to get another MRI. That's going to come out that he got another right. MRI. They're right. trying to get ahead of it, and they're trying to say, guys, don't worry. This is not something to be worried about. But the fact that they tweeted it out like this is the most absurd, like, throw gasoline on 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 embers. Like, there, there wasn't even... There wasn't a problem here right now. We all know he's got an issue and he's recovering. And they're like, there was just no need for the this fire tweet. department shows up with like ten hoses to put out this non-fire. It's like a, it's like a telegrams. It's not a setback. Stop. <laughs> and it's not a reason to worry. Stop. But Dak Prescott's having an MRI. Full stop. Our injury expert Matthew Betts, who is co-host of the DFS podcast and does a lot of you know all the injury work in our ultimate draft kit he says not to freak out yet they're evaluating how much muscle has healed we had a big discussion with him yesterday he was examining what prognosis looks like for this injury when it's happened in baseball players if it's a grade two moderate strain it's a long timeline then then it will be it's a reason to worry yeah and and we don't know i mean i don't know what the difference is between a you know a quarterback's throwing motion in a in a pitcher in terms of being able to get back and get to full strength, but let's wait for the MRI slash hard knocks to tell us what's going on. Another couple of updates, rookie wide receiver monitoring. Rashad Bateman, he's going to have groin surgery. Ah, ah, so my groin. weeks, not months, but surgery, not not surgery. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometime in September return, then you've got to get acclimated. It's not great. And then Elijah Moore left practice today with a member of the training staff. As a rookie wide receiver for the New York Jets. So a lot of camp hype for him. I'm excited for him. But, again, we we kind of said next year. And we don't know what this injury is. So Now, do we make anything of the, the report came out uh, yesterday. Denzel Mims, the other New York Jets wide receiver, he was a second-round pick just last year. And he had been buried on the depth chart. He was playing with the twos, and then it was the well, threes. Now he's playing with the threes, and it was, what is going on? How are they giving up on this guy so fast? Then we heard a report. He had a, a bout of, of horrific food poisoning that eventually caused him to lose 20 pounds because he was sick for two weeks. It was and burnt to, salmon. <laughs> it was not – it was it was salmon. It, he should have burned it to burn off whatever – nastiness was on there but do we is it possible that the him missing all of that time of of the off season is that the reason he's playing with the threes it could be but i feel like the more time we spend talking about any of these jets it's like these guys are competing to not be relevant for fantasy that is correct um but yeah i mean let's let's hope he's feeling better and, and can be given an opportunity with this coaching staff xavier jones rams running back sean mcveigh came out and said the team is quote expecting to count on him through the season. It's good news. Makes he was sense. probably he was probably picked up in all your dynasty leagues when Cam Akers went down. Mm -hmm. But if somehow he slipped through the cracks, it, he's worth checking on because Xavier Jones is, will have to be involved. Daryl Henderson cannot carry the load, um, and you know the camp reports have been very good. I would expect around the goal line as well that Xavier Jones has opportunity to punch in some touchdowns on a good offense. So he should be rostered in all dynasty formats. And then I, I, I wonder wonder what amount of time we should spend here on these two pieces of news. It's weird. But David Johnson is currently listed, you know, behind Mark Ingram and Philip Lindsay, on the Texans depth chart. Um, it's being reported that, you know, like literally Sarah Barshop from ESPN puts it in these terms: David Johnson, last year's starter. So last year's starter is expected to fill a different role similar to Duke Johnson with Lindsay as the starter. They've talked about how much they love Mark Ingram's leadership. He was listed as co-starter with Lindsay. So it's kind of a mess in the Houston backfield, which we knew, but we hoped that maybe David Johnson was the diamond in the rough. But Duke Johnson had no fantasy relevance when he was in that role. Correct. No, I mean, this is a team that is expecting to score very few 
NFL. They're, they're expecting it. Yeah, of course they are. <laughs> they, I mean, because they're still humans with eyeballs. This is going to be the worst team in the league, um, assuming that Deshaun Watson's not playing. And so I have viewed David Johnson as kind of a a very late round value in best ball drafts and larger formats. I've been grabbing him in the later rounds. Um, this definitely gives me pause there because the hope is that, well, he's going to get the vast majority of work for a poor offense. If you're splitting work for a poor offense, no, thank you. Travis Etienne is currently listed third on the depth chart behind Carlos Hyde and James Robinson. Do you care? No, the, I mean, the they, they have not named the starting quarterback yet because rookies get it in here. We, yeah. You guys have seen all the talk, though, with Gardner saying he was going to do it. You know, basically anything he could. Yes, he, in fact, was not making any number twos uh, in the bathroom because is that, num is number that two is unacceptable. That, that helps you? Well, this, uh, Constipation? I don't, I don't think so, but... That's unhealthy, let's Gardner. Let's find out. Gardner, you need fiber. You don't need to be holding it you in. you got to pass through. Wow. But, yeah. Is, is that the equivalent of adding some weight so he can break some tackles? You would add weight. That is, I mean, in the wrong places. Yeah, right. That's uh, some dead weight. <laughs> that was today's news and notes presented by Sleeper. Sleeper's the largest Dynasty platform out there. Customizable. We love Dynasty, and you will love it on Sleeper. Sleeper's great. Easy to use. Before we move on to the running backs part two, I want to thank oh, today's so sponsor, Manscaped. Fellas, you know we've been talking about Manscaped for quite some time on this show. The best men's grooming products out there. Uh, the best body hair trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. They keep taking this thing up to the next level. And speaking of global, I mean, Manscaped is now taking a global. They're in the U.S., Canada, U.K., Europe, Australia, South Africa, Singapore. They are everywhere, and they take care of you, all of your grooming needs, not just trying to get rid of some of that nasty body hair. You got the, the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer. They have deodorants. They have toners. They even have performance boxer briefs, and you can get all this and a travel bag in the performance package 4.0. I love my Manscaped gear. I, I use it very frequently. I, I take care of my grooming needs with them, and right now you can get 20% off plus free shipping with the code footballers at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code footballers at manscaped.com. Trust me, this is the only body grooming trimmer that you need. And we want to thank SeatGeek. Look, football season's right around the corner. Go to games. Go to live events. I am taking my boys to the their first game. I'm going to the Rams game in October. And where do you think I got my seats? SeatGeek. Because I, I'm going to the Christmas Day. I got them on SeatGeek as well. Yeah, SeatGeek Cardinals Geek Colts. is such a wonderful and easy way to get it. You know, sometimes you feel like these ticketing websites are making it difficult on purpose the SeatGeek app is soups easy uh, it's convenient they take in different sources so like even if even if you look around this this the tickets are always going to be available on SeatGeek and then they rank it a one to ten a green scale um to just really show you whether or not this is a good deal. It makes it so easy. The Their service maps, is very easy to use. Yes. The maps are fantastic. The interactive seat maps, if you want to get a good idea of of what you're seeing. I, I mean, I, I can't even imagine using a different app. Every ticket on SeatGeek is also backed by their buyer guarantee. So you could shop for tickets with confidence. And don't worry, we got a hookup. Use the code FOOTBALLERS for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code FOOTBALLERS. Visit SeatGeek.com or download the SeatGeek app today and use code FOOTBALLERS for $20 off your first SeatGeek order. SeatGeek.com Running Bags Running Bags Part 2 Talked through the top 10 names yesterday. McCaffrey, Cook, Kamara, Henry, Elliott, Jones, Barkley, Chubb, Eckler, and Jonathan Taylor. This episode is very important, so pay attention. Last year, on this very episode, Nick Chubb, Jonathan Taylor, talked about those guys. I brought up David Montgomery as my favorite mid-round running back. He ended up having quite the second half quite of the, the season. Year, yeah. And after those top-tier running backs, Finding that perfect RB2 could be 
league winning if you find the guy with a ceiling, mm -hmm. which is why I like this next running back, number 11 on the list, because the ceiling to me is very high. Joe Mixon running back for the Cincinnati Bengals. Jason and I both have him inside our top 10 at number 10 overall. Mike at 14. He's going as the RB11 right now. Last year was a year that was mostly lost due to injury. But uh, this is a workhorse back with pass-catching chops. That is the cliff notes on Joe Mixon and why I like him. Uh, last year in only six games, 24 opportunities a game with Gio Bernard on the roster. This is his team. He's 25 years old. I just really like the potential for ceiling with him, and I think the floor is pretty decent too. I'm not going to bake in, oh, what if he gets hurt again and misses the rest of the year? I mean, right. any running back – that can happen to them. Uh, look, if if Joe Mixon sucks this year, he's going to be really good for fantasy. I mean, it, that that's the honest truth. He's going to get such a percentage of work that if if he is bad, objectively uh, inefficient, he's going to be good for fantasy football. You had Giovanni Bernard last year with 124 carries and 47 uh, targets. No, I'm sorry, 47 receptions. Mm. Joe Mixon is a good back. The way that you're disappointed is injury. You're exactly right, Andy. I mean, that's pretty much how you've been uh, disappointed by Joe Mixon in the past. And, Which and he really – I know that it gets thrown around a lot. And Joe Mixon, he only played the six games. And this last year was particularly brutal because the way that the team was releasing news about Joe Mixon. It was, oh, he has this minor foot injury. He'll be back. He'll be he's, back. He'll be he's back. He's going to be back. Well, he's not back this week, but, you know, next week probably. Ah, uh, you know, maybe in the next two to three weeks, shut down. So that was brutal because you just – you kept him on your bench and he kept clogging a roster spot for you. So that was particularly bad. I I get that. And I we we all felt that. But la in 2019, played all 16 games. The first two years in the league, he played 14 of 16 yeah, games. Yeah, he finishes the RB9 in I mean, 14 games. He finishes 13 – in 2019, and last year he was pacing for 60 catches and 1,200 yards. 14 games as a running back is a full season. And right. here's yes. what I mean by that. You're saying, well, no, that's 16 is a full season. Last year of the top 20 fantasy running backs, so the guys that actually hit the, the best running backs for fantasy football, there were only two of them that played more than 14 games. Everyone misses two games at, at the running back position. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's a guy that uh, I'm confident in. I have had less hope, less excitement in the Bengals' offense as of late. You know, obviously the poor reports coming out about Joe Burrow. He's not looking great. Obviously, the timeline of his injury is still uh, – we're, we're early in the recovery. His, like, earliest full recovery was supposed to be about week one. Um, but, again – if he stinks, if he's not good, then he is a solid RB2. Like, a really good RB2. And and you'll be disappointed he's not an RB1. But if he's decent, if Joe Burrow levels up as the season goes on, you know, if the offensive line is a little bit improved, which it, it should be getting yeah, Jonah get, Williams yeah. back, I mean, Joe Mixon's ceiling is a top five back. There are, you could count them on one hand, the guys that are going to get all the work. And Joe Mixon's one of them. No question. No question at all. He was, even last year, 90% of the rushing share in that offense. And, and unless Samaj P. Ryan is concerning you, um, I think Joe Mix is going to have every chance to kind of have, you know, if you had passed on Dalvin Cook after a couple of banged up seasons, you are regretting yeah. your decisions. Last year, just the, to the final highlight, 24 opportunities a game Yeah, in those six games. Like that's, that is an outrageous amount of work. Yeah, that's 24 more opportunities than like a guy like Carrion Johnson was getting. <laughs> oh, uh, number taking pot shots. I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe because the, the opportunities are just <laughs> fading away. Uh, Antonio Gibson comes in at number 12. Jason has him at 11, his champion. And Mike has him at 12. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. I've got him at 15. <laughs> I don't like what's the trends that are happening. Are you talking about old, old old Gibson Eckler over here, Mike? <laughs> yeah. Gibby Eckler. Uh, I have him the lowest. He's going at RB12 right now. Average draft position of 207. He's the only rookie running back ever with double-digit rushing touchdowns and 35-plus receptions in fewer than 15 games played. Um, he's one of the players that stood out in that examination over the last 10 years. Rookie running backs drafted in the second and third round that outperformed their ADP. He was a goldmine for fantasy players last year. 
He also had, um, what, 11 touchdowns? Is that right? On 180 carries? So, or fewer 170. than 180. Yeah. He had 170 carries, almost 800 rushing yards, 11 rushing touchdowns. There is tons to love about Antonio Gibson. I still believe that the team will be annoying. Uh, Naeem Hines' best friend, J.D. McKissick, <laughs> one of those uh, touch gobblers, will, <laughs> will end up making you frustrated with the total targets and total receptions. But Gibson has every opportunity for ceiling, and it's the same argument here as you have with Joe Mixon. Better quarterback, good defense, level up season, more experience. Uh, one of the things that doesn't get discussed about all of those rookies that you have high hopes for in the second and third round is that we see the one-cut plays by Amir Abdullah, but you don't see missed pass protections. You don't see acclimation to the playbook or, or you know when you go to take the carry and the guy runs the wrong direction like those things impact real depth charts gibson's coming into year two injury is not an issue so while i have him at 15 i do see the pathway for him being a top 10 back he is a sub 4-4 220 pound running back uh when those guys hit they have the opportunity to explode for fantasy football. He's a converted wide receiver from college, so the passing game is capable. Let's say that he's just average in the passing game, not anything special. The expectation, the betting odds would be that this player, player X, don't say it's Antonio Gibson, would be more involved in that aspect of the NFL game in his second year than he was in his first year. Yeah. That's just a natural progression. That's not forcing Antonio Gibson to be the three-down back. That's just, oh, he's coming into his second year. He's better at pass protection, which has been talked about in camp already. And the reality was he is involved enough in the passing game. His pace in the rookie year was 53 targets for 44 receptions. I mean, Dalvin Cook last year had 55 target, 54 targets oh. for 44 receptions. You Good, good thing you've corrected because I was about to drop the button. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we just have to look directly at the situation, you know, versus, uh, you know, Josh Jacobs. The probability didn't pay out because you know what the coaching staff did. You know, Jonathan Taylor might not pay out because you know what the coaching staff did. But what you're saying, 44 receptions is plenty when you go up from 170 carries, yeah. when you go to 220, 230, which is where I think he'll be. And I'm not expecting him to be used. Like we talked about Joe Mixon. He's going to get all the work. I don't expect that for Antonio Gibson, but I do expect Antonio Gibson, if he gets 220 carries and gets up around you know, 45, 50 receptions, he's going to be great for fantasy because the athleticism he has with just that amount of work will be great. This offense is going to be improved with Ryan Fitzpatrick there, and I am very bullish because I do think his floor is around the running back 15. Like he, I, I, don't, I don't think he's a bad RB2, but his ceiling, because of his athleticism, is you know very, very high. So I'm, I'm in love with uh, a couple of the guys on today's show, but Gibson is one of the two I'm, I'm highest on. It's wild that the path that the the team took with Antonio Gibson last year, they talked about the reason he's not in on third down and playing those. They they didn't want to overwhelm him with the playbook, and they're now talking about how Antonio Gibson can be the key to unlocking the the full playbook this year for Washington. He was mostly a wide receiver in college, and so taking him and turning him into a uh, you know more of a two down running back was. Very curious, but he succeeded. He was one of the most elusive running backs. He breaking tackles. He uh, had one of the best stuff rates at, at 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 the offensive line. As in, he's always getting you yards. Where he, he's able to break a tackle or make somebody miss. The Washington offensive line has taken a step back. They've lost some some key pieces, but they're still good enough and. Just with the, the with the Turner offense, I'm with Jason that Antonio Gibson feels like a very safe pick at his ADP, and he still has headroom to outperform that by a a wide margin. Thirteen, Clyde edwards alaire Uh We have a pretty big disparity here, actually. Jason at twelve, Mike at ten. I'm at twenty with Clyde. Um, 181 carries for 803 and four last year. 54 targets, 36 catches. 297 
through the air. He finished at RB21. Uh, he had 18 opportunities a game for the team last year. That is up from what Gibson had, right? Gibson was around 15. Mm -hmm. yeah, 18 is solid. 18 is a lot. Uh, you know, you can talk about Clyde, I think, and be fair-minded without insulting him. And so I think my ranking is more in line with my thought that this team is going to share the load and that during a rookie season in which he had 18 carries a game. Opportunities. Uh, sorry, opportunities. I feel like I got a large enough sample size to see some problems. I think if you're on an elite offense, I prob we probably should have seen a little bit more explosiveness from him to get those kind of games for fantasy at least once or twice. Like we talk about quarterbacks not flashing as rookies. I didn't see I saw Clyde as tried and true. I didn't see him as explosive and uh league winning. And then I just think that they're gonna use Daryl and I think they're gonna use um who's an, McKinnon. McKinnon quite a bit, which is going to take away some of that passing game upside for Clyde. So um only four touchdowns last year. He was the inverse of Antonio Gibson, but I think part of that is game plan. Um and the way that they throw the ball around the uh, in the red zone, hand the ball off to other players. I'm in love with Clyde edwards alaire Yeah, baby! And this is coming from the guy who did not absolutely adore his college tape. Um, I thought he was you know, good, good, good pass catcher, uh, solid all around guy, but he didn't have the explosive speed that I like that, you know, the breakaway to become a superstar for fantasy. And we saw that a lot. I think that's what Andy's bringing up is the fact that like we saw enough to know, like there were some limitations to his game. And I agree with that. However, here's why I am madly in love with Clyde Edwards Alaire this year. There's a couple of reasons. One, I mean, rookies take a leap in their second year. They just get, like I said, they're, this is why I like Gibson. This is why I like Clyde Edwards-Alaire. He's coming into his second year. Also, there's a lot of studies done about the age of a rookie mattering for how they break out. And Clyde Edwards-Alaire is young. I mean, he is, he was, he played his entire rookie year at 21 years old. He is 22 this next year versus like Najee Harris, who we'll talk about in a minute. Who's, What's he going to be next year? Uh, not as, not as old as Najee, the rookie is, <laughs> um, is what he'll be next year. So, uh, the fact that he is on Kansas city's offense with that first round draft capital going into year two at only 22 years old, there is no way that I think he gets worse for fantasy. Like I, I cannot see a, a, an, a, a path where they didn't invest at running back this offseason. They brought, you know, they re signed a backup and they uh, got a someone cut from teams. Like, the, this is not, there's no real true competition uh, for touches here. And just the natural progression of uh, becoming a veteran, I think he's going to have the highest floor of the of the players you draft here. He often falls to the middle of the third round, but you can get him almost always at that 2-3 turn. And if you're someone that drafted Christian McCaffrey, and then you can have the safety of Clyde Edwards-Alaire pair him with him, and I believe have that top 10 upside because, oh yeah, you're in the best offense in the NFL. I just don't see... I feel like last year was such a disappointment on the hype that we are misguided in how how low we're dropping uh ceh in our rankings i don't think you mean we i mean the you mean me. average no 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 i'm talking I mean, about the adp the adp is 14 you're at 12 right so i'm i'm just saying he is often in the third round of fantasy drafts that's what i'm saying is like i would happily draft him in the second round and i will ecstatically drop draft him in the third i don't love seeing players get hurt multiple times at the end of the year going into the playoff run as reasons why the workload's going to increase. Do you think it's going to increase, or do you think he's just going to be better? I think the workload will increase in the pa in the passing game um, because that's just the natural progression for a uh, you know a, a second year guy who's better at those those attributes of pass blocking and knowing the system. Yeah, I I think the workload does increase. You saw fifty four targets in thirteen games. That's really that's that's solid. That that is a solid target share for for a rookie running back. Uh, I I just highlighted Clyde Edwards-Alaire uh, in the Ice and Fire show and just and how unlucky he was when it came to getting a touchdown. So he got a touchdown every 43 touches. 
instead of every 25 touches like the other running backs around him in volume. The opportunities are there. And uh, interesting, you know, I, uh, it was this is just now coming to me of like Jonathan Taylor, uh, Antonio Gibson, you know, the rookie running backs that really took off for fantasy for both of them. It was the second half of the year that they started to shine. I mean, you had the weird training camp with all the COVID protocols. These guys really didn't have a, a full off season. And Clyde, like when he started to miss games, it was the second half. I mean, he missed week 13 with an illness, and then he missed the final two weeks because of the, the leg injury. So it's very possible that Clyde could have taken off there just like the other rookie running backs. And I, I think that... Him in the third round, uh, if you go running back, running back, running back, and Clyde is that third guy, that's that's a sensational start to a draft. All right, Mike and Jason all in on Clyde. Uh, I have my concerns that they have a goal line and a pass catching back on the team, and so Clyde may dominate between the 20s. Najee is at 19 for me, 15 for Jason, 9 for Mike. Uh, Najee will have the workload in Pittsburgh. So I think he's going to be a very consistent running back. Um, he's a first rounder. They're trying to, for the fifth consecutive year, establish the run in this offense and sure. take some of the pressure off of Big Ben. Um, the offensive line is not good. I'm curious what your expectations are from an explosive standpoint for Najee. Do you think there'll be explosive plays, or do you think it's going to be the kind of fantasy production we saw from James Conner, which was – you weren't necessarily impressed with the, you know, per touch, but it was just so many touches. Yeah, it's the, I think a bit of both. I mean, Najee is is an explosive athlete, and he's a great pass catcher. So you could see, you'll see some of those highlights throughout the year of, uh, like back with, you know, when Kareem Hunt makes a, a true highlight play in the passing game. Najee has that ability, except he's a much larger man than Kareem Hunt. And the Steelers running backs, last year the offensive line was trash. I mean, that's an argument for this year. Like, oh, the line's bad. Well, it was bad last year. Big Ben is going to be bad this year. Well, people thought that Big Ben was bad last year. And the Pittsburgh Steelers running back was very solid for fantasy football. James Conner, before getting hurt, was putting up good weeks. Now, you didn't always know, uh, like week one, I should say, when it ended up being – Benny Snell as the the primary guy because Connor got uh, taken out of the game, but between James Connor and Benny Snell, the Pittsburgh running back only finished outside of the top twenty four four times. That's that is a very high level of consistency, and Najee is the guy. Back when Le'Veon Bell was the guy for the Pittsburgh Steelers, twenty four opportunities a game. That's what I expect for for Najee Harris. That's what the team is. Uh, those cards have already been shown in the Hall of Fame game, and the starters played into the second quarter, Najee Harris was getting every single snap at the running back position. First round draft capital, it just makes sense. So with everything Jason was saying about Joe Mixon, of even if Joe Mixon has some inefficiencies, the volume will overcome, and that's why I, I think that Najee Harris is will easily finish as a uh, at least a top 15 running back, and I'm projecting him to finish as a running back one. It is an interesting argument to talk about him versus Joe Mixon because talent-wise, you know, I love Joe Mixon coming in, and Najee, I love Najee. I'm, I'm much more hesitant on Najee because of the offensive line and because of some of those struggles. We obviously have not seen it in the NFL, but man alive did I love the college tape. But when I look at the the – the difference in the offenses, do you like the Steelers or do you like the Bengals offense more for just total points scored this season? Uh, I think I think I like the Pittsburgh defense a lot. <laughs> yeah, but which offense do you think scores more points? I guess Pittsburgh, but so, I don't think either of them are going to be prolific. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I think that they're fair comps. I think you're saying that there are a lot of parallels between Najee and and Mixon. Yeah, I just I have no worry wise. about Benny Snell. I have no worry about Anthony McFarlane. I have no worry about Jalen Samuels. So he's going to be out there for every play, and yeah. that that's foundational. That's safe. And when you look at ADP and outperforming ADP, you know I talked about second and third round running backs. First rounders are almost a hundred percent guaranteed. Yeah, to produce. 
I mean, over the last 10 years, they almost all outperform their ADP. So really strong argument there. And then if you want to transition that to Mindenly thinking about ETN producing, where, you know, Jason likes ETN a lot. 15 and 16, we got to move on. Montgomery and Chris Carson. I'm very high on David Montgomery. Um, he's going to get all of the work in this offense. He showed me elite production over the back half of the year. 96% of running backs over the last 25 years with 250 touches and eight touchdowns finish in the top 15. He's being drafted at 18. Nobody wants to take him. I don't know why. There's like a stench from rookie season that has permeated, not as exciting for some reason. The Bears offense has a stench to it, so you compound those. Sure. Um, I think David Montgomery is has no chance to bust. I really don't think it's possible for David Montgomery to bust in this offense. It would be very difficult for him to bust considering how late he's going. It, he could disappoint and just return on the value. Like he's the running back 18. You drafted him to be the running back 18. Oh, darn, you missed out on running back X who exploded. Like that's why people aren't taking him is because they, they think there might be someone, you know, a, a sexier pick. But I, I would agree with you, Andy. Like the volume that will be there on an offense that is uh, all middle of the pack and was is probably better this year with their quarterback situation than they were last year when David Montgomery they had for sure are. he also showed you that he can explode yeah yeah it when was you against... have when you have eight touchdowns in a I mean that's 12 13 14 15 16 six games that he exploded yeah I mean it, it, it's one of those things where uh you can make the argument and you know of Tariq Cohen going down so he became kind of the only guy in town. Maybe the passing volume was higher last year than you'll have this year. But he also showed the team, you can really count on me. We can have some better offense by getting me the ball this way and that way. So I, I think his, his upside isn't quite as high. Like, if you're comparing him against Clyde Edwards-Alaire, uh, I think both of them have a pretty darn safe floor. I do think the upside is is – questionable I mean obviously he showed last year he can finish finish high but you wouldn't expect that to be something that happens for a mediocre offense over and over and over and over and that I think is the stench as well as just the fact that you don't look at the Bears as some prolific offense and I, I think that the 68 targets comes down for David Montgomery I've come around a little bit you know I've moved Montgomery up in the in my projections and I'm actually I'm above ADP now, which I had been right around the ADP range most of the off season. And yes, Tariq Cohen still injured, but Damian Williams is a good player. He is a good running back, and he is back. And I think that was what he was. Yeah, he was a good running back. Maybe it's maybe it's gone, but Damian Williams is, does not have a lot of uh, usage in the NFL, and won't surprise me to see. You know, like Tariq Cohen, when he was in his heyday, I mean, he was seeing six plus targets a game. Not projecting Damian will do that, but projecting that maybe David Montgomery isn't seeing five targets a game. Maybe that's down at three or so on an average by the end of the season. I hope not. <laughs> I mean, that'd be stupid yeah. of them. He was so good with those targets last year. If you remember the last game of the season, he was nine for nine. He had multiple games where he was getting a lot of targets. I hope they use him that way because. Tariq Cohen is 100% D-U-N. I mean, he is, yes. he's finished. I, I, I agree. Um, but, yeah, the Bears offense questionable. Carson is a player that I'm starting to waver on. Chris Carson, I'm mm. starting to – because I don't see a ceiling. Like, I, I, we know what Chris Carson is and we know what this offense is going to do, but I don't think he has a ceiling. So when you are making a decision between Montgomery, Clyde, Carson, Swift, like why – I think the question is why Carson? Like, why would you take Carson over those players? So I don't think he's going to end up on any of my teams. Well, and and really. the reality is Rashad Penny has has been completely left for dead, um, like genuinely undrafted, an afterthought. And so far, it seems like he's back alive in, in camp. And so this could be a situation where um, I'm not saying Rashad Penny is a, someone you should draft or, or is valuable, but he could be a real problem for – Chris Carson, the way that, you know, when you look at who's around Joe Mixon and Najee Harris and even David Montgomery and Clyde Edwards, Edwards Alaire, and you're like, those those players aren't worrisome to the workload. Whereas here you could say, oh, he could he could lose four or five touches a game pretty easily from what he did last year. Opportunities went down by six a game last year from the year before. 
I did none of this is saying Chris Carson's a great player. Yes. I just think he has a certain level of, like nobody would say this is Chris Carson's team. Nobody would say that everything's running through Chris Carson. Um I think you can make that contention about, you know, a number of these other running backs. So I'm just I'm the highest of the three of us. I'm just wavering a little bit on would I pull the trigger? Like I think the end of the year stats will be there, but for my fantasy lineup, I'll pull the trigger on somebody that might give me a little bit more upside. I I'm in. I'm I'm in on Carson and the the reason would be the, the I mean the ceiling it, it comes down to the Seahawks offense and that he has an elite quarterback. Meanwhile, DeAndre Swift, the offense is going to be poor. He maybe DeAndre Swift is the guy and he's just out there with all the volume. But even if if Penny takes away from Chris Carson and we're still, you know, 16 opportunities a game in an elite offense with with high touchdown upside, that works out. That that, that can work out for fantasy. The team, while it's not his team, he's not I, you were right. It I don't think of Chris Carson being, you know, the face of the team. But they did pay him to come back. They just invested in him, uh, you know, a new two-year contract, not breaking the bank by any means, but it's at least a enough of a, a commitment saying you will be the starting running back. So to 16 opportunities a game, which he saw last year, that feels like the floor for, for what Carson – and we saw him with 22 opportunities He's got a great years floor. Ago. He has a great so floor. He, I'm in. I'm, I mean, I think he's a safe pick. My my problem is where he's going. It, there's other running backs I prefer, and there's Allen Robinson, and there's C.D. Lamb. There's there's just other ways that you could go in your draft. What about DeAndre Swift? Swift Man. is uh, 17 in our consensus, drafted as the 16 right now. Some people are just crazy excited about DeAndre Swift. Be he's so tough because the, the team is terrible. Jamal Williams was a uh, – they they sought after Jamal Williams and Jamal Williams, the running back. He's a great player. The team's going to be bad. The, the the thing for DeAndre Swift that people I I believe are excited for is people had them had him ranked as their number one running back coming out last year. So they're just projecting, you know, the second year of their their favorite running back. He finished it, at RB eighteen with one hundred and fourteen carries. It's, it's it's a really easy argument to 114 carry. You want to talk about Gibson outproducing on the in rushing touchdowns? 114 carries and eight rushing touchdowns. Yeah, holy crap! DeAndre Swift is a great running back. That's he is a, a that's a feature. Yeah, he's he's a great <laughs> running back. Um, he's going into year two. We, we you know this is the the range of those year two running backs. You want to pick the breakout, and he's an excellent pass catcher on a team that requires pass catchers because they have no wide receivers worthy right. of being starting wide receivers here. So the the outlook is he's going to catch the ball and he's electric. The downside is it's the Detroit Lions and the touchdowns probably won't be there. So I find myself usually going the other direction, despite the fact that I. I love the talent, and I have him at running back 14. He's also missed some time in camp. Jamal Williams is there, as we said. So there is a little bit, you know, Jamal Williams is a great pass blocker. DeAndre Swift averaged a touchdown every 38 snaps. I know, and it's funny That's because absurd. this is the, it's the thing about fantasy is it's like, you know, Alvin Kamara broke a lot of metrics for four years where reversion or not being able to do it, and same with Gibson, right? It's like, you go probability or do you go like you found a unique talent? Like both of those things exist. Like some people are more efficient at scoring and we'll find out if it's DeAndre Swift this year. Right. Josh Jacobs at 18. Uh, he wouldn't have been on today's show, I think, if it wasn't for me having him up higher. Jason at 20, Mike 19. I have him at 13. He was the RB8 last year, The somehow the most – Hated RB8 of all time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, he's crazy consistent. He was. I mean, weeks one through eight, he was 14 fantasy points a game. Weeks nine through 17, 14 fantasy points a game. Um, that's what I think you get with him, but you get it at RB19, draft cost. You get a super consistent RB2 that is still very young, that still does have. But, but Andy, they went and signed Kenyon Drake. Yeah, I just I just don't care that much. They didn't just sign Kenyon Drake. They they gave him a very large contract to be a backup running back. I I don't mind Josh Jacobs where he's going in drafts. He's going as the basically the running back 20 
And while I don't think he has some top five upside because he's not going to be involved in the passing game, he only had 33 receptions last year. So if Kenyon Drake comes in and takes over the Jalen Richard, DeAndre Washington role that has always been there, I, I do think Josh Jacobs is a quality back who's going to get a lot of work and nobody wants him because of Kenyon Drake. And uh, that's probably a mistake. I don't have him uh, as high. I, you know, I, I don't have him at, uh, up at 13. But I, I do think that he is a valuable fantasy asset for where he's going. If he continues to fall, like in a super flex, I got I him like in the, the price. Uh, exactly. I got him in the seventh round the other day. And if you're telling me I can get a starting running back in the seventh, uh, okay. And I think he's almost, because of what Gruden and that team does, I think he's almost one of the most guaranteed double-digit touchdown running backs in football. The, we do have to bring up the offensive line has taken yes. a, a perceived major step back. Three of their starters uh, are gone. J.K. Dobbins at 19, Daryl Henderson at 20. Uh, Dobbins is – its he's a difficult player to project because I, I think we all agree the talent is there. I think we all agree that the targets probably won't be. Yep. And I think, you know, we all have Gus Edwards as a potential late, late round value because of his involvement in this team. I don't think the team looks at this through any lens other than we've got two really productive – quality backs that we're going to use, but you also have a running back at quarterback. So are we missing something here with Dobbins? Is there a, you know, we're lower than ADP. Like the, the community is drafting him at 15. I think there's more excitement out there from them than us. So He's probably, are, we, are we whiffing here because there's more upside than we perceive? Yeah, I mean, he he's probably the the player that scares me the most because we have been universally down on him. He's not a pass catcher. I mean, he can do it, but in this offense, they just don't utilize it that way, or at least have not. Um, and if he's not catching the ball, and if he doesn't score touchdowns at the crazy rate that he did his rookie year, um, he's probably not going to be a fantasy superstar. So we've been down on him for that reason. But all three of us love the talent. I know Mike and I were, were very high on Dobbins I had coming him out. I ranked above Swift. Um, last year. And uh, Another he touchdown performed outlier his, guy, too. Yeah, yeah, he performed in his rookie year when given the opportunity. So I feel like this is one where we could eat crow, but I generally am passing on him in most drafts because I want the pass-catching guy. You also would have to take him ahead of where you kind of have him ranked compared to those other guys, and so – you know, it's tough to make to take that plunge at the top of the third. Yeah, at the top of the third, I would I would much rather grab uh, draft Clyde Edwards Alaire there. And if Andy, you were just saying of the you do you go in on the probability or do you go in on this is a special talent? Yes, J.K. Dobbins was incredibly efficient. Nine percent of his carries were over fifteen yards. That's the highest in the NFL. Like he when he got the ball, he went. But we've now seen back-to-back -back years of over-efficiency when it comes to the running back for Baltimore and, scoring touchdowns. And Gus, I believe, is in the same metric that you just quoted. Yes. I think like Gus and Dobbins are both chunk play artists when you are trying but to I'm, cover Lamar. But I'm saying two years ago, you saw Mark Ingram score a, an unbelievable amount of touchdowns given the opportunity he received. Last You're saying year, that could you, happen. you saw the yeah. same thing happen for J.K. Dobbins, and Dobbins is a much better player than Mark Ingram was two years ago. So, right, I, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with the running back fifteen in, in ADP, and I'm betting on Dobbins. Daryl Henderson, I've warmed on quite a bit. He's moved up my rankings. I'm at sixteen. Jason nineteen. Mike twenty four. Um, he's going to have the role. I mean, he's going to have every opportunity. Every team has somebody that needs to, you know, Xavier Jones is going to spell him. But I started, the more I looked at it, the more I looked at how many carries this team is going to have. He's, it's him. He's yes. very important to this offense. Uh, they need Daryl Henderson to be good on this really high powered offense. I'm happy to take Daryl Henderson where he's being drafted because you know, he can catch the ball. You know, it's a great offense. You know, he's the guy, the competition for touches, he he will you know win the majority of of the touches both I I think pretty much everywhere uh, Matthew Stafford throws the ball to the running back and Daryl Henderson has the chops to take it it's just a matter of uh, I know that they are trying to limit his workload because they worry about his injury history and whether he can handle that um, ironically 
yesterday he left practice, hurting his hand, but he did come back to practice. But it's one of those things where it's like they're they're ever, all the word out of L.A. is that they're keeping a close eye on him because they're worried about whether he could take it. So when you leave practice for hand injury, it's like Dah! last last year because Cam Akers ended up being you know banged up to start the season, and Daryl Henderson was he had a higher snap share, but in those first six weeks, he was a top. 24 running back four times, and the first week he didn't even really play. He was a top 12 running back three times. And in all of those games, in all of those fantasy finishes, he was doing that with about 50% of the snaps. Yeah, and you still had Malcolm Brown there, who was stealing goal line carries away from right. him. So if for some reason he gets goal line work, even if he simply gets the majority of it, there's some some hidden upside there for a player we didn't think we'd be talking about on this show. Uh, just a few weeks ago when Cam Akers looked like the future. So, Miles Sanders at 21, Gaskin 22, Chase Edmonds 23. Full rankings with tiers up on the website. You can go to ultimatedraftkit.com if you want to check those out as well. Who are you most afraid of busting from this entire group? I would go Chris Carson. Hmm. I would go mm, Swift. Swift is mine as well. Um. What about who? Who's going to end up on most of your teams? Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Yeah, Cl Clyde and Gibson, or act no, they they will certainly, but probably Najee. Okay, because I I have him ranked so much higher. What about than you, ADP? Andy? Probably Monty. Monty. Maybe Josh Jacobs though, with the draft cost compared to what just the stability I think he provides. I also think Mixon ends up on a lot of our teams. That's probably Andy. yeah, yeah, he has, and. Um, is there a sleeper running back you think can climb into the top 24 that we didn't get to talk about on the running back shows? You know, oh. is it Javante? Is it ETN? Is it Damian Harris? I'll take the first round running back with an undrafted free agent. <laughs> I'll take Travis ETN. And I, I think by the end of the year, Javante Williams ends up as a top 24 guy. Man, who's my pick on this one? I think Chase maybe slips in to, oh, I guess he's already in our top 24. That's, yeah. that's not, that doesn't count. Uh, ETN, I'll go with Jason's pick there. Wide receiver, you don't have to do much, right? You just have to catch the catch the football, and you can be look at DeAndre Swift last year with 115 carries or something yep. like that. So, want to thank Pristine Auction for supporting the show, Jason. You can get a Clyde Edwards Alaire signed full size speed helmet. What is happening? You've got Captain Clyde over here. You got Captain Eckler. You got Captain Gibson. Have you been watching some? He saw, How to be Mike Wright? He I, saw the success of Mike Wright from last year, and he wants in on that. Well, I think a lot of those uh, Gibson certainly, uh, but a lot of them, you know, might have disappointed. And now I'm like picking the right time mm. to to take them, mm. which is this year. Sixty three bucks for that helmet right now ends on Friday night. Josh Allen signed jerseys up there for thirty one dollars. All authentic autographs. Yeah, Jason taking my guys. Andy taking my shirts. What yeah. is happening in this world? Yeah. No, burnt, burnt, burnt sand. Well, is I mean, they sing color. the song, right? You want to be, you yeah, want to be, be like, like mine. Yeah, heavy is the crown, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want a bacon neck on my shirt though. <laughs> uh, PristineAuction.com. Use the code Ballers get a ten dollar credit. That'll wrap up today's show. Brooks, what do we got tomorrow? Quarterbacks, top ten quarterbacks. Oh my goodness. Jason can talk about Sam Darnold tomorrow. Woo! Oh, number one, baby. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.